Before we get to the reasons you're here today and artificial intelligence, let's talk about what we heard overnight. Um, these talks collapsing with the North Koreans. Is, was this the right decision to walk away? It does seem to be the right decision on the president's part. You can't give something for nothing. And we are asking for irreversible and verifiable denuclearization. That's the right thing. Uh, all we've gotten so far from North Korea in that regard is a pledge. And remember, that pledge isn't new, Becky. It wasn't new to President Trump. It wasn't true to President Obama, President Bush too, President Clinton. That pledge was first made by North Korea in 1992. And of course, they haven't lived up to it. So the issue is getting them to live up to this long-standing pledge, and that means a plan, and it seems that the president was saying, where is the plan that takes us step by step to you dismantling your program and step by step by, to us relaxing our pressure? And they seem to want all relaxation, no steps. So where, where does this leave us? There are a lot of people who have said that this is the most intractable, uh, most pressing problem facing us in terms of security. Would you agree with that? Where well, I've negotiated with the North Koreans, and it's difficult. But the only way to succeed is, is coercive diplomacy, where you have uh, 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 carrots and sticks, and you put them on the table, and you say, we can either go upward to a place where there's relaxation, you have your prosperity, which the president spoke very articulately about the potential of, and you have peace, or we can go downward to a, a dark place, where, which none of us wants, uh, where the probability of war, which would be terrible, we'd win, I can tell you that, but uh, it's a terrible war, or at a minimum, uh, continued pressure on you. You're gonna have to pick between those two. That's the only way to do it. And uh, that has, I, I think this isn't the end. I think the president indicated he'll go back, he'll try again. Kim Jong-un will have to rethink uh, what he's willing to do to, get, to make concrete steps forward, not promises, concrete steps forward. In return, we should gradually make concrete steps in his direction, but only gradually and only reciprocally. Let's talk about what you see when it comes to artificial intelligence, uh, the potential advances, the promise that's out there. What, what kind of hopes do you have? Well, it's, it, it, artificial intelligence is now a word that is covering all kinds of things. Uh, but in general, the ability of computation to assist human decision making is a really powerful thing. And it can be a good thing. But like every other technology, it's got an upside and it's got a downside. And so, in addition to exploiting the upside, we need to protect ourselves against the downside. What do I mean by the downside? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think it's very important, and I made this the Defense Department's policy in the particular matter of, quote, autonomous weapons, that it, when it comes to taking human life on behalf of the American people and, and American security, which is what one of the things the Defense Department must be able to do, we won't have weapons for which there will not be a human involved in decision making. And what I had in my mind was, suppose I come out and talk to you the morning after we have done something mistaken, like an airstrike where uh, innocent people have been mistakenly killed. And if I came out, and Becky, and I said to you, uh, well, don't blame me, the machine did it, you'd crucify me, and you should. We need to be morally responsible for decisions. So it's fine to have a, a computer assist us, and that can be a wonderful thing, but there needs to be human responsibility. And that's going to be one of the big challenges going forward. And it's a design criterion for engineers. They need to build it in such a way that you can explain how it came to the, the, the decision. The, you've also spoken more broadly, though, about the ethos for public purpose yes. when it comes to technology CEOs, what they have the ability to do and the responsibility they should hold. I think you thought that this was something when, when you were kind of growing up and learning that the, the your mentors all had. You're not sure that CEOs today have the same. Well, my, my mentors came from the Manhattan Project. And they had invented a dis what we would call today a disruptive technology, it sure is, <laughs> nuclear weapons. And they were proud of what they did because they, it ended World War II in their eyes and it kept the peace during the Cold War. But they also knew they had created a terrible, lasting danger to humanity. And so the same people who had worked on the bomb worked on 
arms control, missile defenses, civil defenses, non-proliferation, all the ways of of trying to make us safe despite their invention. And so they taught me that with the power of innovation, I'm a physicist, comes responsibility uh, for the ethical side of it. And you're right, there needs to be more of that in the tech community today. And one of the things that this launching of the um, uh, Schwarzman College of Computing here at MIT, which I think is a great thing, is a dedication that the Institute has, and I commend it to it, it for it, to ethical application of technology. And we try to teach that to our students here. But this generation of students, Becky, they're hungry for it. They look at things that are going on in social media. Mm -hmm. They look at things that are going on in, in AI. They look at things that are going on in China to use AI repressively. Yeah. Uh, they look at the potential for bioengineering to change life and Talking transform the, the unborn. The baby that was just uh, DNA edited. Yes, born in yes, who, who could not possibly have given consent right. to, to anything like that. They look at jobs and training and how the transformation of jobs can leave people behind. We can't have a cohesive society if we just barrel forward and leave a lot of our people behind. So they see all that and they want a part of their training and part of their lives to be devoted to technology for overall good and they want to know how to do that. And I commend them for it. I think that's great and that's why we're all here. China has made it part of its plan, its 2025 plan, to be the leader in all sorts yeah. of things, including artificial intelligence. They're building a $10 billion laboratory to try and do just that. They don't have the same concerns about privacy no. uh, or a lot of the issues that you just mentioned. Right. How do we compete with them on that front when the government is spending so heavily? Is, is this a war we win? Well, we can't just play defense. We do need to protect ourselves against intellectual property theft and poaching of ideas and all that kind of stuff. But we have to play offense too, which means we have to be excellent and the best in this technology as we have been in so many for so long. That's still within reach. We still have the best people and the strongest companies. But I, my personal view, strong view, is that the government, including the department I used to run, has a role in the country's future in technology. Because remember, when you're doing scientific research, not all of it has an obvious immediate application. And so profit-making companies aren't necessarily gonna do all the kinds of work that will really bring the future. And pr profit-making companies don't necessarily automatically have the same public spirit that we try to express through our government. So it's important that we have an initiative like theirs. Now, I hear this $10 billion number. I just want to, want to say uh, the Chinese, you have to, this is the country that builds cities with no people in them. <laughs> And so I don't know that a $10 billion pro dollar program adds up to $10 billion of really quality work. Right. I still think the highest quality work is done in the United States, including here at MIT. But we got to stay in the game and stay competitive. It's not just a matter of military strength and economic strength. It's also so that our values can continue to be embodied in technology. If they're, if they're the values of the Chinese state, a communist dictatorship, I'm not for a cold war with China, I'm just saying it is what it is, it's a communist dictatorship. That's not the values of America. And we want our innovators to build in to what they do, the values that we stand for in this and all other ethical and moral ways.